want to welcome everybody back to the Behind the Well show. Roger Abel with Elias. What's a good word this week, Elias? What's going on? Another another week. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I'm in football season, so between work and that, I'm just – that's all I think about um, during the season. So that's where I'm at. I'm either working and meeting with people or – working a game, watching film. Kind of it's kind of nice cuz there's only two things to worry about in the fall. But, but you do, but you don't watch you don't do football on TV, right? Like you don't watch games. You pretty much just ref games. Like do you watch the Hawks or I'll record it and I'll watch if it was a good game or something. Did you watch this week? No. <laughs> I don't at first I look at the score and then depending on the score I know what type of game it is. I've watched thousands of Iowa Hawkeye football games in my life. So what was it? 35 to 0? Uh, something like that. I don't need to watch. I know how it went. They oh. couldn't get any first downs. They probably didn't get any yards on first down. They probably turned the ball over. They turned the ball over. Yeah. I yeah, I the first drive they were looking it. good, fumbled. Do you know what the the point average is right now? Well, if they just – I think I saw it was like 31, and how many games have they played? Four? Yeah, that was – And then, he, and then zero. Yeah. And then zero. So 19 that, and a half. Yeah, I was going to say that had to drop pretty dramatically. That means he's going to have to throw up – going to have to throw up like a 50 spot to get back on track. Every game's going to have to be at least 25 plus a 50 spot. It ain't going to happen. No. I don't know. I, do, you, do you really think they'll uh, get rid of him if he doesn't doesn't hit it? Um, isn't that what was outlined in the contract? I think so, but do you really think that'll that would happen? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. He's a good coach. He probably should be a Division One coach, but maybe not coaching. Uh, maybe not calling plays. And he's just coaching the wrong spot. We had when he coached the offensive line, we had the best offensive line on the planet. Now our offensive line's not that good, and he's not he's not good to call plays. In fact, somebody pulled up you know the top offenses in the nation. Once again, we're third to last. And we have too good a talent on offense to be third from last. Right. And it's, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I don't really know the answer, and I don't know. You know, it's easy for fans to talk about stuff, but not at practice. So you don't know really what's going on. But I just know when you watch it and you watch the best teams in college football, they've evolved over time, and we're still running ace, ace tight right power that's great if you can do it but um you know you're also not playing with the type of linemen that they can get at georgia and alabama and schools that can actually run that type of offense so i don't know i'm sure there's a play there's certainly a place for uh coach brian ferentz in college football he's a good coach he might not be in the right spot for I where agree. he's at now in his career and i don't want to be critical because i know nothing about coaching you know i'm an armchair coach played a little high school football that's like the limit so i don't want to pretend like i know Oops. but one of the things you know i was actually down in kansas city this past weekend and um someone asked me what's going to happen with the government shutdown and i haven't really been paying too much attention to it until like the last few days but we're approaching that october 1st deadline and every time we hear of the government's going to shut down people just automatically assume the stock market's going to crash. In fact, I had a client call me nine months ago because I think we were up on a deadline in May. He goes, we should get out. Stock market's going to crash. I'm like, the numbers in the past don't actually reflect that. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. And, you know, we talk a lot with – because there's a lot of, um, you know, gut, anything with the government scary for people – whether it can be have an impact on the capital markets or not. And when you say the words government shutdown, it certainly sounds scary. After some of the things I've listened to and read about it, it does sound scary. It actually sounds more scary for the people that work in government and are going to be expected to continue working without pay or just furloughed and have to go on unemployment. But And I don't know, maybe I just forgot from the last time we went through this, but... I was shocked that people are going to be expected to work without pay during this shutdown period. I don't know. Is that, that does to me, that just doesn't seem right. Well, we don't have any money to pay you. 
But you got to come in. Well, I think. In all fairness, they get that back pay. So when the government does pass a spending bill and gets going again, they're going to get the back pay. So yeah, it's not free, but they still have to go without for however long. Yeah, I think that's wrong. I, and you know what? Not passing a spending bill puts four million people that are federal employees at risk of being furloughed and all those different things. So I think the effect of the government shutting down has much more strain on an individual household than it does on capital markets. And I, and I believe part of that is capital markets believe we will pass a spending bill. It's just when will we pass it? It's not if, but when we'll actually pass it. Yeah. And it will, it'll ultimate, ultimately it's going to, a deal will get done. They'll figure out how to make it work. So a lot of people have asked, you know, based upon the past, how long do these typically last if there is a shutdown? Because there's some politicians taking a pretty hard stance and want some pretty big cuts to the budget to to vote yes for the spending bill. But Goldman Sachs just came out and they had a note that said that the baseline expectation if the government were to shut down is about two weeks. They think that's a strong possibility. I don't know. I'm not a predictor. But one uh, a Moody's analyst, his name's Mark Zandi, floated the idea that the shutdown could stretch throughout the entire fourth quarter, which that's way out there. The longest shutdown we've ever had is 35 days. Yeah, so, so a shutdown for 90 days, that would be – that's almost three times as long as the current record for the longest shutdown. Yeah, so I, I think that... That seems a little excessive. I it, hope that doesn't happen. You know what it goes to, though? If, if you're a federal employee, and we're just going to talk about the individual household here a little bit. If you're a federal employee, it's probably more critical than ever for you to have an emergency fund. Just start planning. And I'm guessing they are. My cousin works for the government. I think they plan for this. And if you're not, you should be thinking about it. Like, how would I at least make it for 35 days with no paycheck? Yeah, right. So, yeah, if you're a federal working for the federal government, part of the equation of your emergency fund should be a government shutdown. Yeah. And it, then it's and then, you know, your premiums, all the or uh, deductibles and all the other stuff we talk about. But to me, it's almost like the minimum starting point. OK, if 35. Well, they say 35 days is the longest. Yeah. So no less than probably a month and a half of minimum, cash. Minimum month and a half of like everything paid that you're paying for plus your emergency fund. You have to have both Yeah, because correct. you still, you know, bad stuff typically happens in threes, right? It could happen that you're furloughed, your dishwasher goes out, you get in a car accident and you go to the doctor. Well, next thing you know, you went through your whole emergency fund in 35 days. So if you're potentially going to be furloughed or, not get paid yet you have to figure out how you're going to make it make a go of it but then there's the other pact is really the stock market and and what's happened i've got a little chart so if you're watching this on youtube you're going to be able to see this but i think people just dramatically overinflate what's going to happen i'm going to read some statistics here so during the shutdown of 1990 this lasted three days the s p 500 was down two percent at the end of the shutdown well that's not anything meaningful 1995, it the shutdown lasted five days. The S&P 500 was up 1.2% at the end of the shutdown. 95 to 96 lasted 21 days. The S&P was exactly flat during that period of time. 2013, the shutdown lasted 16 days. The S&P went up 2%. 2018 lasted three days. S&P was up 1.5. And the most recent shutdown was 2018 to 2019. It lasted 35 days, the longest on record. And the S&P um, ended, the end of the shutdown was up 7.3%. So if you add this up, the government shutting down has very little effect on the stock market whatsoever. This shouldn't factor into your your decision making. And it really goes back to a little bit of what we always talked about, Elias, that this is why it's hard to time markets. It's why it can't be done because people would see this as an event to provide opportunity to get out or get into a market. Well, at the end of the day, it's pretty random. If I, if I pulled a hundred people and said, if the government shuts down, what's going to happen to the stock market? Is it going to be up or down? Most people probably answer down. They're going to answer down. When in reality, 
more of the time, it's only been down one time. Every other time was flatter up. So I think if you're worried about this, the wrong thing to worry about, worry about your emergency fund, worry about all the things that you can control and don't worry about what, what the government shutdown is going to do to your, you know, your stock market portfolio. And truth be told, if you need to use the money out of your stock market portfolio tomorrow, you shouldn't be in the stock market anyway. You you don't have the right asset allocation. Mark. Yeah. That's not an appropriate allocation. The, yeah, the money you're planning on spending in the next month should should not be invested. And, um, you know, we talk with families all the time. Our our clients and our families that we work with know that we believe it's not possible to time the market. And, I, you know, I, it'd be great, like, if there was some data or there was anything that suggested it would be possible because that'd be a great trading strategy if you could time it effectively. And I always jokingly tell people, Trust me, if we could time the market, we would certainly be doing it. And at that point, you might not even have to help other people with their investment portfolio. But that kind of brings up, that's a good transition to the next topic. This is something people are starting to do. It's almost like another bucket of money that people are starting to have for themselves in addition to an emergency fund. And it's being referred to as an opportunity fund. Um, So with saving and investing, like there's the common goals of, I need to have an emergency fund. I need to be on track for retirement following the the pandemic. And I think the pandemic has, it kind of shifted a lot of different mentalities, um, whether it was, you know, living, living more life today or starting a business. I've always been thinking about starting, but what, what people are starting to do is they're starting to save money for, for that an opportunity. It could be a big vacation they've always wanted to do. It could be a business that they wanted to start. Um, So I think one thing I was thinking about when you're identifying opportunities and things that maybe you would like to fund in the future, you start to view, think through the lens and start to define what is the life that you want to live. And I think more people have spent time thinking about that certainly since the pandemic i guess if there's one silver lining from that the shutdown and just how odd life was for a while everyone probably had more time to reflect on you know we we talk with clients about lifestyle design and those type of things well let's figure out the lifestyle you want figure out how to make that work um you know what's ironic about opportunity funds there's another name for these they've been around forever Sinking funds. It's sinking. exactly the same same thing as a sinking fund where really what you're trying to do is give your money some direction for specific ideas that you want to accomplish. So I've used sinking funds forever. And a lot of people who follow Dave Ramsey do too. So like you got a Christmas fund. Okay, well, that's an opportunity fund. It's just, it's always been called a sinking fund where you make a contribution to it to build it up to use it at some point in the future. Well, opportunity, okay, guess what? Mine's called a vacation fund. So we're going to take a vacation. We put X amount of dollars in there. So we're planning for the vacation ahead of time. See, sinking fund, that's like the old, it's old school. Yeah, it's boring. It's school. Opportunity fund, that's new. That's exciting. That sounds I, like what I want to do. I mean, you're telling me about this. I'm like, well, this is just the old school sinking fund, but no one's excited about a sinking fund. <laughs> Everybody gets excited about opportunity Sink, It's kind of got a negative name too, though, sinking. No, you're, you're right. It's kind of like- Opportunity sounds more optimistic. It sounds- it's like the no like, budget yeah, lifestyle that. that Jonas wrote. Yep. He's trying to break the connotation of budget. It doesn't mean you, you just get to not have a budget, it's just a different way to do it. Yeah. You're still giving your money direction. More positive light, probably. Yeah. So I, I think three things here when we're talking about sinking fund, opportunity funds, just setting yourself up to hit those goals. Three tips and ideas here. The first one, treat money as a tool. And I like, I like that because I think a lot of times – Money can be an emotional part of people's life, but really at its basic function, it's a tool to accomplish different things, whether it's transacting to buy things that you need or whether it's paying for services to help enjoy life, paying for a vacation. But if you can kind of detach the emotion of it and just view it as what it is, it's really a tool to provide opportunity in your life um, that can help your relationship with money matching investments 
with your goals. This is another thought I was having. And to me, I don't know what better way to do it than to do some financial planning and say, you know, our firm, we specialize in goals based planning. So let's outline goals, view money as a tool, and then here's some investments that match with the goal. So each goal is going to have its own time horizon and risk tolerance, right? Like if you have a goal of, I want a 20% down payment on a house within the next 36 months. Okay, well, through the lens of investing, that eliminates a lot of choices, right? If you're gonna put a big down payment on a house in three years, stock market, sh that's out of the question. We're not doing that. We're not putting that much risk on the money. Now, is there other things that are reasonable to do with that money? Yeah, but it's probably gonna be more fixed income type stuff, CDs, things that are safer. You're not gonna make, you know, you're never gonna knock it out of the ballpark on your returns, but that money's gonna be there when you need it. And you've already defined when you need it. So matching investments with goals. And then a third idea, celebrating small wins. I think uh, I think one of the biggest hurdles, I know it, just in me, for me, for people in general, when you have a goal and it's a more, it's a harder challenging goal to accomplish, you get too involved in, the end and the big and the big picture at the end but you can celebrate small victories on the way and making progress so like the example i just used you want 20 percent down over the next 36 months to put down on a house to buy your first home the first month you decide hey okay this is going to be 800 dollars a month the first month you save that you should feel good about that you're still 35 months away from achieving the goal, but you should feel good in, in, in accomplishing that task along the way. It also, just with the psychology of money, celebrating small wins, if you think about why someone like Dave Ramsey's baby steps are so effective, it's because it's the psychology of it. It just feels good as you go along and you're rewarded for accomplishing, um, accomplishing small tasks. So I think if people you know, with these opportunity funds, if you can kind of build it that way, put some thought into it, be proactive with it, feel good about the things you're doing. I think you can have a lot of success achieving those. Well, and if you can get good at the opportunity fund idea, I think you're really setting yourself self up for a successful transition into retirement because there are a lot of people who are really fearful of retirement and not because they can't retire. They're just fearful of how it works. And I have this conversation with people a lot, Elias, and it's almost like we can sit down and do a financial plan and lay everything out, and they just can't pull the trigger to retire because they're so fearful of taking this asset that they've used as an accumulation asset their whole life. They've been told you can never touch this thing. You can't use it. If you take it out, there's penalties and fees and taxes and all this stuff. So then to get to retire, they're like, psychologically still in that mindset and it's hard to get people to overcome this. But one of the things I've been you know, thinking about is how do we help people overcome this versus just saying, Hey, you'll be okay. Because that's what we I, tell people. Yeah. Like it's easy for us to say, well, yeah, you'll be good. Here's the financial plan. We have this plan, but psychologically they still don't feel good about it. So what I thought I'd talk about are kind of a couple of ways that I've seen through my experience that people make this transition and become successful with. And I have a couple situations where I, I had a individual couple come in here. I want to say they were like 57 or 58 at the time said, we want to know if we can retire tomorrow. We want to retire. We don't really love our jobs. We'd like to retire tomorrow. And I showed them that they could, and they came back every year. And this went on for like four years. And every time they're like, well, we just can't bring ourselves to do it. And it was like getting over the psychological hurdle. And then finally they came in and said, today's the day. And they never looked back. But I, I think of, and this is probably you know, like 10 years ago. So my guidance 10 years ago is clearly probably a little different than today. And one of the things I do with people who are struggling with this is I tell them to take a breather, like not just like jump in and start taking money out. Why don't we phase into this? And it could start, like I've had people who are like, why don't you just stop contributing to your retirement plan for six months and save that money up in your bank account? So that when you hit retirement, you're just going to live off the bank account for a little while and get comfortable. So like phase them in versus just, oh, you contribute, now you pull out. Because it's less scary. 
So that's the first thing. Like I talk with people who are really scared about this is phase in. And I gave this advice to a couple probably six years ago. You know, they're used to making the same paycheck, right? They're used to getting $8,000 a month. And literally like they retire and they're like, okay, we need to set up our, our systematic distribution to get 8,000 a month. I'm like, do you need 8,000 a month? Well, that's what we've always got paid. I go, do you need 8,000? Well, we don't really know what they needed. Or they said that we don't really know exactly what we need. I said, well, how about we do this? How much is in your checking account? So I had them write it down, checking and savings, what their balances were. I said, based upon that balance, you're probably not gonna need any money from this. So how about we don't take any money out because you don't need to, and we're gonna meet in 90 days, and we're going to see what the balance of your accounts are. And they're getting their social security check. Yeah. They, they came back into any bank account money. They've added to it. They've never called for. So were they taking social security? Yeah, then? it's got social security yeah. and they had enough money saved. They've never ever taken money out of their accounts. So what it was for them is that fear of, Oh my gosh, we're going to run out of money went away. Cause they're not even using any of it. And I knew they weren't going to, but it was kind of a way to phase them in versus just saying, hey, yep, let's set it up just like it was before. Because if I send them that money, what's going to happen? They're going to spend it. It's going to go away. So that's well, the other. Or, or they're just their bank. They'll get so much money in their savings account. And then they're going to call and say, so what do we do with all this extra money in our savings? account?" I always tell people all you're doing, if you're doing that is moving money from your right pocket to your left. That's it. Yeah. Like nothing good's going to come of that. So that's the second way people can kind of phase into this. The other thing, the third thing people can do, if you're really nervous about this retirement transition is to use the bucket strategy. Like we've talked about, you know, if you start to give your money responsibilities, which kind of coincides with that opportunity fund you just spoke about. If we give our money responsibilities, we know how and when we're going to use this money. We're less likely to become emotionally attached to the movements of the stock market. So making sure you have the right investment allocation is really key to any good distribution strategy. I mean, if your distribution strategy is I'm going to leave it my target date fund and just take money out every month, that that's not a distribution strategy. That's winging it. There's no thought to that. Well, and how how many of our families certainly during the bear market, we're like, okay, I get why you guys do it this way now, right? Where before they're asking about there's cash and there's these other positions. Well, then you get into a bear market, but you know, you're going to get your check every month without selling your equity investments. And we have, right. We have time to let the market recover. The last thing I talk to people about who are struggling with the transition into retirement, just the mental part of changing from accumulation distribution is maybe you just don't stop working. Maybe you stop working the job that's got you to where you are and you take the job working at a golf course just so you have a little bit of play money in your pocket and you feel like you have money coming in. Because for people we're recommending or helping retire, it's because they're in a good financial spot. If they're not, we tell them they can't retire. Like retire at your own peril at that point. So just thought today would be good just to talk about some psychological things that can help the person who's trying to kind of get over the proverbial hump of going from the accumulation phase to the distribution phase in life. Yeah. And there's, um, you know, there, there's also sometimes people get forced into, into early retirement. So we also put together some tips on, uh, surviving that coping with it, however you want to look at it. But if you're in a situation where you're potentially going to be uh, maybe not forced into early retirement. It could just be you got offered like a severance pa- severance package and you're not really sure. Um, but anyway, you're just all of a sudden you have an opportunity to retire earlier than, than what you were planning on. And to tag on to something you were just saying about continuing to work, you could consider part-time work to just have a paycheck coming in if that's going to help you feel better about it and maybe get a little more free time back but you'll continue earning some kind of paycheck. Reducing expenses, which this is always, you know, living on a budget, reducing expenses, no matter what part of life or your investing career, this is always going to be something something you're faced with. Hopefully, as you transition into retirement, the expenses, expenses have been reduced, meaning 
like the mortgage is paid, the cars are paid for, just all those things that can really put stress on someone's cash flow have already been taken care of. And if you're to get uh, laid off or something, taking advantage of unemployment benefits is a good thing to do. Everyone pays in, so it's not a free benefit. There's money that comes out of everyone's check to pay those premiums for your entire working career. So if you're 60 years old and you get laid off and you're already thinking about retiring, maybe you just got to take some unemployment for a while and that'll help you phase in, right? Like that's an easy step. Get a little bit of money, start practicing what being retired would be like. Here's one. This one's kind of, this one's kind of crude, but cut off your adult children. I'm always in, I'm always a fan of this. I don't like to see people helping adult children, sacrificing their own financial future. If you can do both, that's great. It's great to help out family. But at some point, um, you got to become an adult and you got to pay your own ticket in life. Elias. You're smiling. What? <laughs> what did I say? Every time I hear cut off your own children, all I can think about is there's so much more room for activities. Yeah, that you don't movie. Need every to be time step brothers, step brothers movie. And, right. Every time I hear it, that's all I ever think about is step brothers. There's so much more room for activities. Hey, uh, if, <laughs> if you got your adult kids living at your house, I'm sure there's more activities and it's maybe more fun. Um, financially, probably could be less stressful. You could get with. Actually, I'm going to skip one here, but be smart about collecting Social Security. I think this one, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about taking social security. A lot of people make this decision based on someone told me they did it this way. This coworker I work with said this. At the end of the day, there's the facts about how it works and there's maybe the way you feel about it. I think doing some financial planning and actually making a decision that positions your family um, in the best possible position considering social security is the best way to do that. And making that social security decisions, a lot of times consulting a financial advisor is a good way to do that. I know with, with our firm and the way we do business, we have a um, social security planning tool. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to do it because Elias said that's the way to do it. I'm going to show you the facts of the situation and at least educate you on the decision and the differences between doing X versus Y. Ultimately, what people decide you know, that, that's their decision, but there should, I, I want them to have all the information before they decide and understand how it's going to impact their income planning, you know, maybe their tax situation as they get older and all those type of things. And the last one, and th this one's a really good advice for anyone, pursue hobbies and other things that make you happy. You know, early on in retirement, it's always fun for me to see families that are really spending time kind of in the go-go phase where they stop working and they're traveling, they're seeing everyone they want to see, they're doing the hobbies they want to do. And it's fun to hear those stories and fun to, you know, I'm, we're not there with them when they're doing it, but it feels like you're kind of part of it because they're having all these fun experiences and, you know, and whatever it is, once a month or once a week, twice a month, the paycheck's coming into their account they feel good about every, all the work we've been doing together. And they're just, they're living their best life, as people like to say. I think that's all really great advice. And, you know, I think the one you skipped over here was consult an advisor. You know, if you're struggling with the transition to forced retirement, early retirement, get a hold of an advisor. Let them know if you're going to be okay. And tell them your situation. They'll just walk you through it. If you want to help from us, you can go to btwellshow.com. Uh, with that said, this is a great show, Elias. I think we hit on some important things. I think my major takeaway from today's show is just focus on what you can control. All these items we talked about are controllable items. You know, we can't control what's going to happen with the government shutdown. We can't control if you're going to get forced into early retirement because of the government shutdown. But what can you control? whether you've done a plan, whether you have an emergency fund, what your asset allocation is, all those things combat all of these unknowns. And that's the greatest way to bring just a higher sense of financial security and peace of mind yourself. You have any other closing remarks? No, no, I really like that. That's 
you know, I'm always a big fan of control the things you can. And it's, you know, the other things, yeah, they might be on your mind, but it, if you control the things you can control, then hopefully just don't worry about them as much. So I want to thank go. everybody for listening today. Feel free to follow us on social media, btwellshow.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>